So as I mentioned earlier, that we have a, a, a program uh, that is put together by the Presbyterian woman. Uh, and initially, we uh, had wanted to do a reception with some food and drink uh, after the anniversary service. But um, I think the, uh, the, the woman, after a brief discussion, uh, and thought that drinking and eating during pandemic is a terrible idea. So uh, we decided that we're going to uh, have a program and just for everyone to, uh, to stay behind, seated safely. Uh, and we have lined up a number of speakers uh, that will speak about uh, the, um, uh, what they know of St. Giles uh, in, in, in its history uh, and, and some of the things that we're looking forward to. Uh, so. At this time, I'm going to uh, pass this to Laura, uh, who will start us, start us off. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to explain the hat first. I want the photo up. Note how many hats like this are being worn in 1928. And at the end of this presentation, not my presentation, but the whole half hour, I'm going to uh, ask anyone who has a hat to throw it up in the air because that's a mark of celebration, but it also is a mark of the passing of time because I don't see anybody other than me wearing a hat today. This is my mother's hat, by the way. Um, I'm going to just speak briefly about the photo, which is in the narthex, which is, shows the people of St. Giles after they dug the first hole in the ground from which this edifice eventually emerged. Now, why were they digging a hole in the ground? Because in 1925, the Presbyterian church had been torn in half by the debates about church union, and two-thirds of Presbyterians in Canada joined the United Church, which left um, a number of congregations and disaffected Presbyterians with no building. And this building is a post-church union building dedicated to the new Presbyterian Church in Canada. So just quickly, I'm going to try and give a context to 1928 and uh, briefly the period afterwards that followed. So not only did we have church union and the debates, but we had an Ottawa that was recovering from the economic downturn that followed the First World War. And in that environment, um, Presbyterians continued to worship and to study and do all the things Presbyterians do. My own parents, who were Presbyterians but not in Ottawa, I thought I'd just capture what they were doing in 1928. My mother was 12 and she was going by streetcar in Toronto to St. Andrew's Church downtown every Sunday with her grandfather, who was the church treasurer. My father, who was 13 years older, the son and grandson of Ontario Presbyterian ministers, um, had finished, had graduated from Queen's, the Presbyterian University, um, and had just acquired a doctorate from Cambridge and was off to teach at Harvard. So he was considered you know, the great success of his Presbyterian community. Um, things changed after 1928, and that moment of hope and uh, achievement and um, future um, wonders was decimated by the depression that came in, started in 1929 with the great crash and then went on into the 30s, leaving many unemployed. I can't imagine what it was like for the congregation of St. Giles, having their hopes so rudely dashed by a world that seemed to be falling apart. There's a context to that that is similar to today. Um, then, a few years later, the Second World War broke out, and the plaques behind me are a testament 
to the service of members of St. Giles to that war. And we stand today in a time which is not that dissimilar to the time in which this church was first initiated, where we have a building and a community and incredibly difficult times, but we are holding fast, as Reverend de Rees said, and uh, we'll continue to do so. So I'm now gonna pass this microphone over to Jane Evans, whose family has been associated with St. Giles since that hole was dug in the ground. If you come up here, Jane. But once you're here, you can take your mask off. I am a third generation member of this congregation. And as Laura pointed out, people on the building committee with my grandfather, Thomas Urker, and he and my father, Gordon Urker, were longtime elders of this congregation. On May the 12th, 1929, I was baptized by A.G. Cameron. And December the 3rd, 1955, I was married by Dr. Logan Venta. Then Hamish Kennedy officiated at the dedication of the window that my brother and I placed in the church in memory of our parents, Margaret and Gordon Urquhart. I thought about this for a while and I thought, what does that make me? So I got out my dictionary, I looked up October, octogenarian. I thought, no, I'm too old for that. So I looked up fossil, and it said, well, somebody who's very set in their old habits and ways. I am trying to work on it, I assure you. I'm going to speak on our longtime relationship with the Cameron Highlanders. The Cameron Highlanders are Ottawa's only military regiment. And they have been associated with this church for almost its entire history. Our relationship with the Camerons began in the early 1930s when Dr. Logenvecta became their chaplain. He was their chaplain for the next 30 years. During that time, he went abroad for World War II service, came back to this congregation and resumed his time with the regiment. Today, I'm giving a very brief talk and I will highlight a couple of periods of involvement with the Camerons. World War II was probably the height of this congregation's involvement with that uh, regiment. Uh, during that time, it was a time of military church parades and the Camerons used to prayed from the drill hall up to the Bank Street, come down here and fill this, fill this church. What we have in the first slide here, it, Rob has just put up, is in May 1940, the Cam they're Cameron's colors. They're the colors that you see behind me were laid up at St. Giles for safekeeping during World War II. They were retrieved by the regiment in 1947. They were, the regiment continued to use them for approximately the next 20 years. And then again in 1967, there was a big service here when these colors were donated to St. Giles 
when the regiment obtained their current colors. So the colors that you see there have been there for over 50 years. What you have here is the regiment leave, leaving this church at the time that of laying up those or donating those colors. Now, more recently, the Camerons participate with St. Giles in a number of things. First of all, they're here every remembrance service. They've been here for the Battle of Britain Sunday. But the slide we have here is for their participation. The in, in 2007, their commanding officer suggested having, having the pipe band put on a benefit concert here for the <coughs> Centertown Emergency Food Center. And that is held outside of COVID, of course, every, the first week in December each year. Now, the second picture is, r relates to this. This is Pat Brush's picture, by the way, that she took from the back of the sanctuary during one of those concerts. For Sigel's part, we have supported the Camerons with care packages for their deployed soldiers. During the Afghan period, that was a period where approximately half the regiment served abroad and we supplied a hundred care packages to them at that time. Even more recently, and just thinking of the last year, we have sent packages to the Cameron soldiers who were in Camp Borden as part of the military's assistance in the Ontario long-term care problem. But uh, also this year, we have sent packages on two occasions to the Camerons who were deployed with the Canadian military in the Ukraine, helping the Ukraine army with what it, you know is their problem. And on a couple of occasions, we have given care packages to the Central American nation of Mali, which has, is having many difficulties, as you know, and we've sent a couple of care packages for the Camerons there. As you could appreciate, these soldiers get a number of things when they're deployed abroad, but I think the feedback is that of all the things they receive, they appreciate most greatly the baking that they receive in the care packages from St. Giles. Perhaps today on Remembrance Sunday, we might reflect on the Cameron's motto, which is advance, and what that means for our future. Today, also, we are pleased to have Corporal Pat Parker Broda with us, playing on Bank Street and more recently or upstairs in the gallery. So that is my brief summary of over 90 years of involvement of the Camerons with this congregation. Good morning. Mm -mm. Over the past 96 years, St. Giles has had many families that have worked together. <clears throat> My grandparents, William and Mary Turpy, have been attending since, since 1945. 
Mary, my nana, was involved in the women's group and all the events that were put on by them. Um, William Pum was was at the time in the army. He served as a, he served um, St. Giles as an elder and as a trustee. I have uh, been fortunate enough to be able to serve as a trustee at the present time, so I've carried on a little bit of that history. <clears throat> in 1951, my brother Hugh McEwen, who was able to attend today, was baptized here. In 1965, my Aunt Jane and my Uncle Jack were married um, by the Reverend Logan Venkta. Um, it's one of the pictures that I brought was of their wedding. Um, the other photo that I was able to bring was um, one of a memorial service honoring members who served in the military I am very thankful for all these memories and that some, uh, and that also that some of my family is here today. My mother, Margaret McEwen, my daughter, Samantha Rye, and my brother, Hugh McEwen. Thank you very much. I'm talking about the uh, <clears throat> exhibition that uh, I think most of you are familiar, but basically it was run at Lansdowne Park in uh, August for about 10 days. So St. Giles started in 1957 with a small booth serving food with just benches around the outside. In the 60s, we expanded, yeah, <laughs> we expanded to a much larger booth. That's my father. Um, <clears throat> but we have to remember that it wasn't just a 10-day period. Uh, there was the constructing of the booth, the ordering of supplies and the charging, making the dreaded phone calls for volunteers, <laughs> uh, and of course the tearing down and taking away. But uh, also, remember that the booth also was from 8 to 1 until midnight. So after, which uh, included four shifts a day.
Okay. I said, recognize this book? <laughs> yes. This is the new Presbyterian Church in Canada hymn book. Now, we have stopped calling it the new book because it actually came out in 1997. But this particular one, I don't think it's been used very much. I found it upstairs. It's banished because of COVID, but we will be singing directly from it and Pat won't have to type out the words for all the hymns. St. Giles was one of the first churches to order a full set. Why am I doing it? One of the first churches to order a full set of the hymn books. And we also bought a box for Gracefield Christian Camp in memory of George Lee you saw at the exhibition booth there. That summer, 1997, our daughter Amanda was at the camp and spent time at sitting at the piano with director Dorothy Herbert. And they were singing, or they wanted to sing all the hymns in the book. Now, they wished there was time to do that. But it gave them an idea, particularly Dorothy, who's a good one to run with an idea. Dorothy talked to Julia Mills, our organist at that time. She was very keen to have a big musical event here. They recruited my help and the elders were very supportive. I got busy calling all the Presbyterian churches in the area, and the area might have stretched almost to Montreal, um, and other singing groups.
Uh, go back. Go back one. Okay. Uh, I became interested in the gardens around St. Giles very soon after we came 28 years ago. I joined the garden team whose mem members included Edna Fraser and Doug Bruce. Edna encouraged me to remove weeds such as psyllium and Doug introduced me to miniature hostas, some of which I still have in my own garden. Over the years, Laura has shared with me the task of garden weeding, and that has been done on a regular basis. Laura and I took over responsibility for the garden along Bank Street, and I had a happy summer building the stone wall to enable me to build up the garden bed. I have found that working on the garden encouraged pedestrians to chat, and during my wall building uh, activities, um, an elegant lady congratulated me on my wall building and asked if she could employ me as her stonemason. I explained that I was so slow that any commercial endeavor of mine in this direction would be doomed to failure. I have found that a relatively low maintenance garden consisting of bulbs in the spring followed by daily days in the summer and mums in the fall gives um, a very good, sort of colorful uh, show without, um, without uh, too much maintenance, too much watering. As I mentioned, um, when you're out in the garden on, on Bank Street, there's an awful lot of foot traffic. And I remember late one summer being surprised by a middle-aged lady coming up to me with a plastic bag full of coins. And um, she said that through the year, she and her fellow travelers on the number seven bus that stops outside St. Giles had collected change and they wanted to make a donation to the expenses of the garden that they looked out from the bus over the year as they traveled to work. That was very encouraging to get that. In more recent years, St. Giles together with the Glebe Community Association, the Glebe BIA, and Rito Glenn, the owner of the lawyer's office across the parking lot, agreed to construct a small park area adjacent to our north lawn and to plant some large trees, as trees are being lost in the glebe due to construction and uh, old age. This picture shows a large red oak being planted on the north lawn by Manatec tree movers. While the Bank Street Garden has suffered over the last two years of construction on the Bank Street, the stonework and then the rebuilding of the window, which thankfully I can report to the congregation is now complete and the scaffolding will be coming down uh, hopefully later in the week, the next week. Um, the beauty of plants, a beauty of plants and gardens is that they can always be resurrected. And this restoration of the garden will I hope happen in the next few years. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll be glad to know that I'm second last. And I made the unfortunate mistake of listening to Laura Brandon about wearing a hat. And I went further. I even had my hair done specially for the occasion, you know? And what, and what do I get? Just a, Rob, thanks very much for wearing a hat. And by the way, I'm not showing it up because I'm afraid that being orange, there might be NDP people here, and I might not get my hat back for next Halloween. Anyway, uh, coming to the microphone twice today, I feel like a candidate for tomorrow's election. But uh, no heckling, please. 
uh, or throwing gravel, all right? I am to say some words regarding the banner hanging at the front south door of the church. There she blows. If you come in the side door, you don't see it. If you use the elevator, you don't see it. And if you are of my age group, coming in the front door and looking down more concerned with not falling on the stairs, you don't see it. Just stop and look up. It is there, all right, all 12 foot by 5 foot of it. The idea was from the Reverend Houtby when she came from Sackville, New Brunswick in 2006. She couldn't get it done there, asked if there was anyone who sewed in the congregation, and she was directed to my wife, Margaret, who was making quilts for cancer patients at that time. The idea behind the banner, Common Threads, is that people from every walk of life make up the kingdom of God on earth, and the Spirit is working through each to further that kingdom. The variety of people is represented by the horizontal and vertical strips of multicolored, multi-pattern cloth. The congregation was requested for strips of fabric which had meaning for them, such as ties, scarves from school, college, or university, aprons, shirts, blouses, nightgowns from close relatives or friends. Margaret and the church ladies went to work on a trestle table on the second floor of the Logan Venkta Hall across the way. Anything of the process that could be worked on at home was accomplished. As you can imagine, it was a convivial time around the table. Meanwhile, two lone men, Ken Lister and myself, busied ourselves trying to keep up with the demand for threaded needles from the no-nonsense ladies. It should be remembered that Ken was the driving force behind us having the elevator in this church. At last, the time came for the last stitch to be made, and Edna Fraser produced enough wine for us to toast a job well and truly finished. At a suitable time, the banner was raised in the church and dedicated by the minister. The banner was just another example of the involvement of our wonderful ladies. Along, the bizarre, along with bazaars, required meals, letters, cards, and settling in the Lewis family from Nigeria, or Jean Curry in the church office for several years, Parcels, as Dawn mentioned to the Camerons in Afghanistan or elsewhere, I certainly ask God for his blessing for all the ladies have done in the past, the present, and I'm sure the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. You're, I think you're creating the orange wave all by yourself. So, um, before I get to the picture that I want to share with you, uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, that we had arranged for one speaker, uh, Jean McNally, but she's not able to be here. So, I, I do want to say a few words about uh, the Cun uh, Cunningham window. Uh, do we have that? Yes. So uh, Jean was supposed to speak about that window, which is at the back corner, uh, and this is uh, that window is uh, dedicated to dear father and mother in loving memory of Robert and Jesse Cunningham. Uh, and given by Helen, Eva, and Jean. Uh, so uh, the Cunningham sisters 
uh, Helen, Helen and Eva are twins, and, um, and sad to announce that uh, Eva uh, passed away uh, a, a week ago and uh, in the, uh, the extended care medics. And uh, so because of that, uh, uh, Jing uh, doesn't feel like she's able to share. Uh, so, but uh, there was another picture, uh, which is the dedication of that window, and you will see uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Loken Venkta at the far left corner, uh, and um, uh, another minister, Hamish, I believe, uh, and, and that's uh, Helen and Eva, uh, the twins, uh, by, by the other side, a uh, picture of that dedication. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge those two pictures, and uh, next time when Jean is able to join us, uh, we'll, we'll have for sure ask her to share about that story of that windows. Uh, and so let's go to the next slide. So this is a slide I want to share with you. This is actually uh, of the service on May 30th, uh, a Sunday service, and the picture of the people who are joining were joining from Zoom. And uh, as you know that uh, we had started to do a passing of the peace, so I acknowledge everyone that joined us from Zoom. and. Uh, and it, I remember at that time, uh, we were still in the middle of a lockdown. So we're permitted to have 10 people uh, in person. I think that particular Sunday, we had eight in person. And the others joined uh, from the Zoom. And so I, I picked that particular Sunday because we have people that joined from all over the world. Uh, we have. Miriam that joined us from Calgary. She was visiting her daughter at that time. And uh, of course we have uh, uh, Dong, Kate, uh, and, and Stan, Jing, uh, Bob, Jan, uh, Bill, and Laura, uh, member of the congregation. And uh, we also have a um, friend of mine from TRC, uh, Joshua Su and Esther and her uh, and, and their family, uh, four kids, uh, along with the background, so make it look like there are eight kids, but there were only four uh, that joined us uh, from Montreal. And Kawakang um, uh, joined us from, uh, I believe, Mississauga, uh, a member of St. Giles, now is um, uh, finished his study here in Ottawa, has returned uh, to Toronto. And so Kawakang and his brother Bodhi uh, do join from time to time. And uh, Daisy, uh, and also I think the, my boys were there, but in the background, they once again don't want to show their face. Uh, and uh, from Montreal as well. And also Bill, uh, so that's uh, Dong and Kay's son uh, joining us from uh, um, Dubai. Dubai, right. And, uh, and, and his friends, I think. So it, it just shows that, that uh, the, the reality uh, of COVID, but it's it also a blessing in disguise where uh, friends, families, old friends from all over the world can worship together. Uh, so uh, we're still not quite out of the COVID and, uh, and, and I want to, well, thank the congregation for inviting me to join in this story, in this family, uh, and hopefully for many years to come. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm looking forward to make more memories with you and more story to tell and share for the next generation. Thank you. <laughs>